Welcome to a modern nonprofit podcast powered by the Charity CFO, your compass for creative solutions and running your nonprofit. I'm Tasha Anderson, your host and guide through this nonprofit maze. From fundraising to volunteer management, we've got your back. Join us each episode for fresh game changing strategies that can make a real impact. Hey everyone, welcome back. We have another episode of A Modern Nonprofit Podcast. I'm Tasha Anderson, the host, and today I have a new friend with me, Tamala Aldridge. Thank you for joining us, Tamala. Tamala, you are the executive director of an organization of Only Make Believe. I'm so excited to dive into your story. And I should say, Tamla, we don't always have a lot of executive directors of nonprofits on this podcast, but occasionally I just like to sprinkle those in and highlight what is an actual executive director that's actually doing the work right here, right now, doing what's their story, what's their challenges, what keeps them inspired and keeps them doing the hard fight that you all are doing every single day. So thank you for taking time out of your extraordinarily busy schedule to join us here today. No, thank you, Tashi. It's my pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Uh, as an executive director, what am I doing now? I think most executive directors <laughs> would agree. We juggle lots of things. Lots All of, of things. the things. But um, the most important thing has to be the passion for the mission, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Keeping that first and forefront. Keeping so tell us, yes. yeah, tell us a little bit more about just to um, set the ground for those that are listening. Tell us a little bit more about your organization, uh, Only Make Believe, and kind of what you all do and what you kind of specialize in, just to set the groundwork a little bit. Oh, great. Only Make Believe creates and performs interactive theater for children who have medically fragile conditions, mm -hmm. children who have developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And what's so special about what we do is that we meet children where they are. So mm. we bring our performances to hospitals, we bring our mm -hmm. oh. care facilities and to special education programs. So I um, I, yeah, I think we, we make theater accessible to them by meeting them where they are. I love that. I. Little known fact about me, um, Tamla, when I, before I started this firm, it's been about eight years almost to the day. And, uh, but before I did that, before I started this firm, I worked as a CFO of a nonprofit and that organization, their largest program was with medically fragile, you know, children also with some element of developmental disabilities. And I was fortunate enough to tag along with some field trips and occasionally we would take the kids out to, um, gosh, what would they call it? Like music camp. Um, and it was so fun to see children that were suffering from like seizure disorders or, um, you know, just really significant medical needs that they weren't always incredibly responsive or had a high degree of alertness, right? Because of brain injuries or other things. And to watch them, really start to be more aware or just kind of their little movements and things while listening to the music and just, you know, the energy around and um, it makes a really big difference. And I, I have really fond memories of, of thinking back on, you know, I think children that otherwise would not have had a chance to have this kind of experience and through like music and rhythm um, or any other sort of performing arts, um, even if they don't have you know, or if even if they suffer from like visual impairments or hearing impairments, as some of the kids that we did, uh, that, that we had in our program did, even just the movement or the vibrations on the ground, because all of our kids were non-ambulatory, so they could feel like the movement as they sit in their chairs and things. It was, it was really cool. So kudos to you for doing work um, in that space. So, well, everyone, so has I, an, everyone has an imagination. Right? Yeah, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you are dealing with medical conditions or if you have a developmental disability. We all have imaginations and mm -hmm. we take in information differently. So mm -hmm. it's always mm -hmm. been interesting to me, you know, yeah. years starting out as an actor, I always studied human behavior. So mm -hmm. then working with this special, these specialized populations, it was it was truly intriguing to me mm -hmm. how these young people engaged and how they interpreted the information and then how they were able to then push it back out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you kind of 
hinted uh, on your life before you became a leader of a nonprofit. I always like to ask this question every time I talk to somebody that's working with or in the nonprofit space, how did you get into this situation? <laughs> how did you end up here? You said you were an actor before. And that's always a funny story because it's a good conversation starter. So I was an actor for many years. I lived in New York City mm -hmm. and only make believe Actually, I started with them as an actor in two oh, okay. So we hire professional actors. So mm -hmm. these are actors that you've seen on Broadway, um, mm. in regional theaters, in television, film. Mm. And uh, because we know that they have a skill set that is quite unique mm -hmm. to, to reach our population. So I was fortunate enough to audition and I became a member of the acting company in New York. Oh, and cool. It was, you know, aside from whether I was doing a, a theater job or a television job or a film job, you know, as a as a up and coming actor, you always had to have a, a stable job. So mm -hmm. I thought, <laughs> right. I mm -hmm. thought Only Make Believe was really cool because um our founder, her name is Dina Hammerstein. Mm -hmm. uh, she's part of the um Hammerstein Musical Theater family. Okay. And she was an actress as well in her early career. So mm -hmm. she, when she started this organization, she was adamant about paying actors. Because mm -hmm. so many mm -hmm. times artists are asked to give yes. their gifts of their talents. So, you know, and she was like, no, this is like people have training. This is a skill set. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is a gift. Mm -hmm. And it has a value. And right. so I love the fact of being a part of this organization. And it was a part of, it was, it was honestly, it was my, part of my creative economy. It was my stabilization. Mm -hmm. It was my stabilization. So you, you were, you know, and you had an acting career and, you know, you were a parent. And so I'm sure, you know, the connection with children and creating programming for children that otherwise wouldn't have it, it resonates with you. I'm really curious how you made that transition and like, what was the biggest learning curve for you? Or like looking back now, like, wow, I can't believe I, you know, survived that because running a whole organization, especially a nonprofit organization is tremendous. I just had a, another conversation earlier with someone that says that when you step into leading a nonprofit, it's essentially the equivalent of stepping into a publicly traded company with a board with audits, with public scrutiny, with the need to perform, with the, with the need to measure everything and report out on everything and have all of the opinions coming at you. I thought that was an incredible analogy. Um, and especially for someone, it's not that you, you know, came with a whole business degree or you started with an organization and you eventually, you know, worked your way up and you, you learned bits and pieces of the operation. That must have been a huge like shock for you, I would guess. It was. It was. So, I mean, yes, I was an actor, but I actually, I, I graduated from Howard University. Many years oh, great. Ago. And my father and my parents were very supportive of me going into the arts. But my father was just like, uh, but you need to uh, have a backup plan. Okay. So I actually got my degree in arts administration. Oh, Which was great because as an actor... You need to know how to market yourself. You need mm. to know how to manage your finances. You need to know how to handle business. I had a professor in college, mm -hmm. uh, Henry Edmonds, Dr. Henry mm. Edmonds, and she would say, uh, the word is show business, but before you can ever do a show, you have to be able to handle your business. Oh, wow. So I, I've always had that about me. And so working with Only Make Believe, I think the big, big, biggest pivot for me as an actor and then making a choice to go into this direction as an executive director was my husband and I found out we were going to be parents. I was mm -hmm. And he lived in Washington, D.C. I lived in New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been married for three years. You know, it was it was great. It was always a honeymoon when we saw each other. Right. Right. Once my daughter was on the way. Um, we'd made the decision for me to move to Washington, D.C. Mm. It just so happened that a, a board member from New York, her husband got a position with the federal government. So she was relocating her family here. So mm. the founder of the organization and the executive director at the time approached us and was like, what do you all think about doing an expansion in Washington, D.C.? 
Oh, okay. And I'm going to be honest with you, Tasha. I I grabbed onto it like it was a lifeline. And I'm going to mm. tell you why. Because um, I was moving. I, I'd been in New York for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I, I knew what that life was, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd been married for three years, but it had been a commuter marriage. So I felt like I was uprooting everything. Mm -hmm. Going into this on this new journey and mm -hmm. to have something that I know that, mm -hmm. I, you know, I know what this is. I can do this to kind of anchor me as I'm in this new environment. I grabbed on to it. So I was seven and a half months pregnant and me and the board member here, her name is Sarah Roseanne. Mm -hmm. um, we just contacted some facilities, uh, health facilities here in D.C. for mm -hmm. children. And we uh, auditioned some actors uh, at her Jewish school where her son was going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got a conference room, auditioned actors. I hired five actors. I taught them all the shows that I knew, uh, set up a schedule, and then I went on maternity leave. But I wow. thought that gave me a creative outlet as I was in this new environment. I was in my last trimester of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so it, mm -hmm. it came up to ground me. And so I had my daughter April 1st, 2012. And around July, the executive director at the time contacted me and she's like, so, you know, what are your plans? What are you thinking of doing? Mm -hmm. and I, said, oh, I just really have no idea. I don't know the theater landscape here. You know, I've right. been here once before when I was in undergraduate school, but that's been so many years ago. Mm -hmm. And she said, because we really need someone there on the ground. To, mm. to keep it going. What you got going was great. We need someone to keep it going. But if you don't want to do that, we'll respect it. Yeah. But I was just like, well, you know what? Because I'm still figuring out mommy hood. Um, yeah. Very much sleep deprived. <laughs> you know? yes. I was like, let me stay with this because again, it it gives me myself an identity. Still as talent, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. as mommy, not just as wife, but still talent. Yeah. So, I started doing that and I just, it just, the program in DC just grew and grew and grew and I didn't know what I was doing. I'm going to be honest with you. Right. I, I learned how to write grants on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what really helped me is my viewpoint of how I work based mm -hmm. upon my theater training. Mm -hmm. so What's that? E even though I'm an executive director, I still very much think in an ensemble way mm. of working. I cannot do this by myself. Yeah. I, yeah. I do not have all the answers. I cannot generate all the ideas. Right. So I think having that level of, and just being honest and open, very transparent. And I, I would say to people all the time, the things that I know, I know. But there are a mm -hmm. lot of things that I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I actually met someone who worked at the DC Commission for the Arts and Humanities. He actually sat down with me and told me like the outlines of writing a good grant. So just mm. finding those support systems naturally, and I'm just thinking of working in an ensemble sort of way for the mm -hmm. good of the organization so that we can continue to serve as many kids as possible. I'm really inspired hearing your story, especially in light of, and I'm sure you've seen it, uh, all of the kind of articles coming out about the burnout at the leadership level within nonprofit organizations, especially women, you know, you said earlier before I hit record that, you know, you made an, a very intentional choice to enter the nonprofit space. And it sounds like you make intentional choices every day when you keep showing up and continuing this work. Share with me a little bit more about maybe what you think that intentional choice and maybe not having that intentional choice or if you've thought about that at all and like why there's so many people burning out on this industry. Okay. So uh, the first part, the intentional choice, I think I made the intentional choice to focus on this rather than trying to be a, a freelance actor again, mm -hmm. after I became a parent and mm -hmm. in the first three years of my daughter's life, she's, we had several hospital visits. Mm. So I ended up, getting the other end of what mm -hmm. the other experience that parents mm -hmm. get when their children are in hospitals. So mm -hmm. then that I already enjoyed engaging and playing with the children, but that mm -hmm. gave me another um, level of 
you know, the impact we're having, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, as a nervous mom, my my daughter has RSV and, you know, has to have these, um, she's in this confined container mm -hmm. and I like mm -hmm. to just reach in and touch her hand. Sure. And we are watching an only make-believe performance that was happening within the mm. hospital. And I'm oh, just cool. like, what we're doing is, is, is for me as a mother at that point, mm -hmm. It helped me keep my stress down. It helped me make this less stressful for my child. We mm -hmm. were singing, like you said, the music, the dancing. We were singing mm -hmm. and enjoying the show. And it just it just resonated with me on such a, you know, visceral level. Mm -hmm. that I think that's when I made the intentional choice that this is it's great to, to make kids smile. It's mm -hmm. great to, to bring them joy. But mm -hmm. also what I found in that time, because even, even though she couldn't call into the show because she was isolated, mm -hmm. the actors were asking questions and she was responding. And mm -hmm. in that moment in time when she really didn't have control of anything, I felt sure. like this really gave her a moment of empowerment because mm -hmm. she could engage in the way that she sure. responded. Yeah. So I think at that moment, I was just like, yeah, I'm all in for only make believe. Mm -hmm. And how can we serve as many people as possible? Because I actually think now I think this is the most best kept secret for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows about this organization that right. in New York in 1999. So I, I, that's when I made the intentional choice mm -hmm. to, 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 to step on this track. Mm -hmm. Now, burnout is, is real. And, you know, I think burnout was real prior to the pandemic. But oh yeah. After the pandemic, it it I've just kind of seen people actually leave the nonprofit sector. Right, right. Because it's so much, and like you said, it's so much um accountability, it's so much um evaluation, it's so much, you know, um fundraising driven goals. You know, it, it's it's a lot that you have to do. And as an ED especially in a smaller nonprofit, you know, I'm the executive director, I'm the artistic director, director of human resources. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, all these things, I'm like, I'm learning. All right. These things. I'm learning them uh, in real time. And I think what was really helpful for me is that, especially as the pandemic uh, descended upon us, our board was like in transition. Oh. And because we did all in-person programming, you know, we knew that during this time of isolation, the, the populations that we serve needed us more than anything. So we mm -hmm. were able to, you know, just start doing some type of virtual content. You know, there was right. no, there was no blueprint. There was no plan right. because nobody right. would see this was going to happen. But the board members who stayed on were really committed to it, to where... Mm -hmm we were able to not only keep the organization going, but mm -hmm. now in addition to being able to return to in-person programming, we mm -hmm. have this robust, robust, excuse me, robust virtual programming that's mm -hmm. in 16 cities now. That's and incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. And I think, you know, you, you hinted on a couple things, like, you know, certainly you have your art administration background. So I will apologize in advance. I, misjudged you. I work with a lot of creatives and all the things that you mentioned about, um, you know, what your professor taught you about show business, emphasis on the business. I meet a lot of amazing creatives. And I always try to tell my team, look, there's two sides of the brain, okay? And there's the creative side. <laughs> there's the side that we typically operate. So give grace to creatives because they, they just don't think this way. So I misjudged you when you said, I, you know, studied acting and I'm an, you know, I was an actor. Um, so kudos to you for kind of embracing that. And we can do a whole nother episode on that uh, alone. But you are for, as a leader, especially a, 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 an evolving organization or a smaller organization that doesn't have every function built out and a huge budget to pay for all these things. What I find what really attributes a lot of that burnout is that you have to learn things on the fly and you have to spend a lot of your time oftentimes doing things you're not necessarily good at, or at least you don't feel like you're good at, you're not necessarily comfortable, you don't know how to do it, you have to figure it out. And a lot of times that means things that are taking you away from what you, you like really love, right? So 
you, you mentioned you're kind of the executive director, director of HR, director of all these things, and also the artistic director. Obviously, being an actor, the artistic side is probably what is, you know, feels more natural. But then when you have to figure out marketing and board development and, you know, fundraising and, you know, compliance with different grants and HR issues and like all of the things moving one organization from, you know, operating in New York to Washington, D.C. and all the compliance around that, you know, from, you know, just a geographic standpoint. Uh, it's a lot. And I think that is definitely a, a point of frustration or just certainly a, a large contributor to the burnout. Yeah, in this space. I agree. And um, it is, I think you said something, you hit the nail on the head when you said you're figuring things out in real time, things you don't know, or things you, you kind of don't really feel like you're doing well. You're right. excelling at. Right. And, I find that two things with that. Um, here in Washington, D.C., there's an organization that supports nonprofits called Spur Local. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, they created a cohort of executive directors where we mm -hmm. would get together once a week and just release. Mm -hmm. Because nobody understood it more, you know, better than right. the executive director. And so that cohort actually has become my, you know, my alliance. Support group. Yeah. yeah. It's become my alliance. We still meet. We met last week. We still meet. We still mm -hmm. uh, run questions by each other. We, mm -hmm. we, we, we're, we're thought leaders amongst each other. Of yeah. How can we do this better? And how can we not be so hard on ourselves? And mm -hmm. um, I think one thing I, I, I share with them, because again, I'm the only creative in mm -hmm. it is I work from transparency. Mm -hmm. So I never walk in the room acting like I know I got this. Right, right. I walk in the room like I'm a stakeholder in this organization just like everyone else. Right, right. And if someone has an idea, let's let's take that idea, let's ruminate on it, let's get mm -hmm. us some some strategies and then some mm -hmm. practice of how we can implement it. Um and I, and, I, and I work from that vantage point. I think that relieves some of the stress. I won't say all of the stress. Mm -hmm. Some of the stress of feeling like everything is on my shoulders. Right. Um, I also think, you know, having a good, not just a good relationship, having good communication with your board mm -hmm. is essential. Because a lot of times what I, I, I've, I've come to know about executive directors, it's... Um, it's the it's the stress of feeling like you have to justify mm. every decision mm -hmm. that you make to yeah. this, this board, to this yeah. body of people who are not in the day to day. Right. And they don't know. And mm -hmm. and it, it took time. I mean, the relationship I have with my board, uh, I've been the executive director since 2018. It's done mm -hmm. a complete 180. Wow. You know, it's yeah. not a complete 180. And I will also be, you know, as a, to be honest with you, as a woman of color, mm -hmm. serving as an executive director. And then when I go to my first board meeting, I'm mm -hmm. the only person of color there. Right. The majority of the board members are white males. So it's right. just like, yeah, it, <laughs> but seeing people for who they are, we're all here for a collective reason. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on that collective reason. And I think mm -hmm. that's how we get over the the quote unquote expectations we have of the roles, right? In right. relation to the organization, I can see that when you you know what you're talking about being an executive director and completely, you know, probably subconsciously or unintentionally, I think by default having a little bit of like a defensive posture because you do have to explain, you have to answer all of the questions. You have to keep your staff happy. You have to keep your funders happy. You have to keep your board happy. And then when people start asking all these questions, you can't help but to think, okay, well, I'm explaining this and this is my decision, but you're asking me this for a reason. So, you know, it's just kind of human nature to start thinking about why did they ask me that? Was that a wrong decision? You know, and because you're just, constantly overwhelmed with inquiries and questions and problems that you need to put out um 
or, you know, fires that you need to put out. It's, it's a lot, it's overwhelming. And I, and I love this conversation because I think a lot of people step into um, the nonprofit space. And I read a statistic that was posted like August of 2023. So not that long ago that said that the nonprofit industry has the highest turnover of any industry, like any industry period, which, you know, you can blame it on money and things of that nature, certainly. Right. But then also I was kind of thinking about what else is kind of contributing to that. And from my perspective, you know, I used to work for a nonprofit. I have several employees that have chosen to kind of leave, you know, serving in the nonprofit space directly. Right. And I have a lot of nonprofits that call me because they've had turnover too many times, like in their accounting and finance function, and they're picking up the phone and trying to, you know, find a more permanent solution because of that ongoing anticipated turnover. And, you know, I think it's just the constant pressure, at least in my experience, which just the constant pressure from all of these different angles, that really is almost just too much and feeling like it's hard for you to say, I just don't know the answer, or I need help. And you don't know where to get the help. And by the way, you're spending all of your days on this like hamster wheel of things you don't know what you're doing you're trying to figure it out you're building the plane while you're flying it meanwhile being pestered or peppered with all of the questions and having all of the doubts and insecurity and i share all this because this is a good bad and the ugly it's extraordinarily rewarding and i said fine i'm not going to serve the nonprofit community in this way but i still have a commitment like you i had a very intentional commitment very early on in my career this is what i feel like i'm called to do and as rewarding and, and amazing as it is, it does come with its own set of real challenges. And people yeah. should know that. <laughs> it, it does. It's not, it's, I mean, you should want to be here. You know, mm. I think that there are people who land in the nonprofit space and I don't know if they really want to be here. Mm. Mm. Um, they think they did maybe originally and they maybe find out... Yeah, and, and and that's okay. You know, that's mm-hmm. all right. You know, this organization has experienced turnover, but I'm also proud to say, you know, I'm going on my, what is it, 16th year mm-hmm. with this organization. My operations director has been here 12 years. Mm-hmm. My director of programming has been here 12 years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that you know, is is some key roles have stayed here, and again, mm-hmm. they made an intentional choice. Yeah, to stay yeah. Here and that helps. Growing pains are real. Mm-hmm. You know, if it, if it's if it's challenging, mm-hmm. you're doing something right. Yeah, that's true. You're doing that's something true. right. So, right. and instead of you know just keeping pressing forward, what are we doing right, and what's mm-hmm. really working here? And then how can we gradually build upon that based upon the bandwidth that we have? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's having that conversation because I think everybody sees the end goal mm-hmm. and they're ready to be there tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I'm ready to be there tomorrow. You know, I see this organization bigger and better than, you know, my imagination can hold. Mm-hmm. Um, do we have a infrastructure footprint to support that right now? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely not. You know, when you were describing that, you know, if you're if you're feeling the way that I interpret it is if you're feeling uncomfortable, if it feels hard, you're doing something right. And I think I know I have at different times either working in the nonprofit space or shoot, even running my own business. It's like I'm waiting for it to get easy and I've just accepted if it's easy, you should pause and maybe be a little concerned, or just frankly change your mindset and set your expectations reasonably because it's probably not going to get easy because even if you don't change things for yourself, the world has a way of changing things for us. Right. So, um, and speaking of like forward thinking and kind of seeing what your goals are, I'm curious, what are your goals kind of for your organization? Where do you see it heading um, kind of in the near or kind of distant future? Yeah, I mean, I we're all we've already accomplished that. I wanted it to become a nationwide organization. Thank I, you, pandemic. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, uh, the pandemic, the silver lining of uh, virtual programming. We have mm-hmm. become a nationwide organization. 
Um, I want to expand on that with our in-person performances too. So we have a, a headquarters in New York. We have a DC office. I do foresee in the future having an office on the West Coast mm -hmm. um, and maybe somewhere in middle America. But yeah. I just do think that there is, the virtual program is fantastic. Right. But you can never beat an in-person experience. Sure. So sure. I still want to bring the, the the inspiration, the imagination to as many children as possible in person. So mm -hmm. that's that's the bigger goal. And I think what we learned from our expansion with DC is before you just, you know, set up a shop and put up a sign, you mm -hmm. really have to make sure you have the support in that area. Right. Right. For that work. So I think that's where the virtual program is actually really going to help us. Mm -hmm. where we can do shows. We're actually uh, in one children's theater, I mean, children's hospital now in the California area in Orange County, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they're already learning about only make-believe. Mm -hmm. So then I'm thinking of looking at, you know, businesses in that area who support sure. that children's hospital. Right. And introducing, we're only make-believe. We're already there virtually. We'd love to be there in person. Mm -hmm. Can we have a talk and see if there's an alignment or mm -hmm. partnership? You know, I wish we would have thought about that before when we right. did see. We wouldn't have had, you know, some of the um, headaches we had. <laughs> in sure. Some DC until it, 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 it settled itself when it grew. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's where the virtual program is really going to be an asset for mm -hmm. us to reach that goal. And, you know, every stakeholder for Only Make Believe, the vision is to serve as many children as possible. Right. So I, and I think, I think this is important too. I think every executive director has a shelf life. Mm -hmm. I think you figure out what it is you want to make your goals while mm. you're in a position that you can hang your hat on. Sure. And say, this is what I helped this organization accomplish. And it's fine for you to pass the baton to someone right. to take it to the next level. Right. Yeah, you know, I think that's something. yeah. That's good. I, well, and it makes you think, and as somebody that's a founder and, you know, the managing partner of my firm, but I, I know that eventually I'm going to pass the reins on. And I think this is important for any business owner, I would say, especially a founder that's an executive director of a nonprofit, figuring out, you know, answering that question for yourself. Like, what is the goal? What is the threshold? Where is the point where you're like, I am satisfied with this and now it's time to handed on to someone else, you know, succession planning has always been a hot conversation in the nonprofit space. But, and of course, finding somebody to take over is, is, is related, but kind of a separate issue in my mind. It's, it's the executive director um, or whoever's leading the organization, any organization asking themselves that hard question, when is it time for me to pass the baton and working towards that and just yeah, being mindful of when that is and starting to create some of that succession planning when you know that you're kind of nearing that. So that's an interesting question. Figuring out when that is. <laughs> Figuring out when that is. And um and again, giving yourself some grace mm -hmm. in that. Um, because you also have to think about what then will be your next journey. Yes. I think a lot of times because we're so inundated with so many responsibilities, we just think about how oh, I'm going to do this for two more years and then I'm going to find something else. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what that something else is for you, mm -hmm. why put a time limit on yeah. what you can give right now? Mm -hmm. Again, being so just meticulous about what is your goal? What what What's the last thing uh, legacy and impact, I would love for my leadership mm -hmm. to have this organization. Mm -hmm. And um, I had spoke, um, had a meeting with our um, governance, the chair of our governance committee, and we were talking about this. And I was like, you know, succession planning is a hot, so it's a buzzword. I said, but it's real. Mm -hmm. And this organization is bigger than any of us who, who are involved in it. Right. So, right. Yep. So, we take it. 
to where mm -hmm. if Tamla isn't here, if this board chair isn't here, mm -hmm. if, a, if this organization will maintain. So I felt like the last, especially two and a half years, it really mm -hmm. has been about codifying yeah. the OMB program. Right. And, um, really making record of it. Like, you know, I, I learned on the fly, all of this institutional knowledge in my head cannot yes. walk out the door. That's right. Yeah. It cannot walk. Otherwise, the organization will always be trade war. I see that all the time. All the time. I mean, obviously, I see it mostly on the accounting financial side, but I know that I've seen this, you know, especially when I work for a nonprofit or even I hear from our clients, every key function of their business, so much of that. We're, we're working so quickly, we're learning on the fly, we're fixing things as we go along, and there's really no record of it. So that when, I mean, even just things like how to bill invoices for key funders, no one has any idea, right? How to use certain key functions of a software, no one has any idea. Where these records are housed, no, one, it's just, we take for granted how much we keep in our minds until the people that are left remaining after that person leaves is kind of scrambling to to get things in order. It's a real, it's a real challenge. And it's hard for us to slow down and like you said, start codifying some of these things, but it, it really is important. It's it important. really is and, for and that next generation, for sure. I tell my staff, you know, this, this train doesn't stop. Mm. You know, uh, we constantly have programming happening, right? Sure. We're constantly doing outreach to uh, supporters and funders. But we also have to do what I call this. We have to clean up the house. Mm. We, we have mm -hmm. to clean up the house. I think when you step outside the door, it's wonderful what we do. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure once we invite people in, whether that's new team members, new board members, new stakeholders, period, mm -hmm. that they're coming into a well-kept and sure. organized space. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. I have one last question for you because I know I'm always, I'm always doing this. I'm always running out of time. But I was having a conversation earlier about doing more with less. And you talk about this expansion. And so many organizations are trying to figure out how to do more with programming, understanding some of the challenges with funding issues or rising expenses or fill in the blank, you know, can't find the right talent, that sort of thing. So your expansion plan, is that following the trend of trying to do more with less or kind of what is your strategy for that expansion? Um, I'm just curious about that. Well, that's, that's a big goal. Yeah, that's a big goal. And, you know, we've been fortunate enough that um, our partners in the children's hospitals, mm -hmm. a lot of them have their own audio visual technological capabilities. Oh, so yeah. It's live stream. But mm -hmm. It, it somewhat limit, limits our artistic choice because mm. um, you know hospital staffs are already again they're they're like they're a lot like the nonprofit space right right a lot of turnover has happened they're sure tired, they're exhausted and though the programming OMB provides is great you know they don't have an artistic background you know right. a lot of people a lot of times these staff members are part of the child life department so mm -hmm. you know they're thinking I, I need to just hit this button hit this button whereas if we really want to use if only make believe really wants to use our virtual programming to uh, just be the driving force behind our expansion we need to be able to have artistic control and mm -hmm. codification of what that virtual programming looks like. So mm -hmm. it is right now we're working on getting funding to mm -hmm. here in our DC office. We just moved. We have a large multi-purpose room building our own digital studio. Oh, neat. Well, and so, I asked that question because when you talk about, you know, plugging in virtually to all of these different hospitals all over the country and just getting those commitments and getting that collaboration and participation with those hospitals, what an incredible reach you can have that I would imagine to some degree can be duplicated um, without the extreme cost of setting up shop in each one of these places. Exactly. And that's why I, th I thought I thought of, you know, doing a lot more with, I wouldn't say less, but without adding much more. Right? So like right. huge gains without huge right. gains and expenses. So I mean, that kudos yeah. to you. When you think about opening up another office, 
you know, that's going to, to run you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, Extremely a expensive. year to manage. Yes. Right. Whereas with this virtual studio, it may cost us $100,000 to build. Right. But once it's built, we have right. it. One time. Yeah. One time. Yeah. One time. You can use it over and over again. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Tamla, this has been such a cool conversation. I love talking to leaders like you um, that are just in the trenches every day trying to do really out of the box thinking um, and just being really creative about how do we expand programming in light of all of the challenges we face, whether it's geographic limitations, funding limitations, and it's really cool to see you choosing a very specific population you want to work with, with a very specific program that you're trying to offer and rather than just keep adding a bunch of different programs that might support this population or taking the creative side um, and, and just making it more even more accessible to other people I'd love your kind of duplicating model um, hopefully nationwide and hopefully in partnerships with with children's hospital I will say I have another client um, that's out on the west coast that had a not the same programming at all, but a similar model of partnering, partnering with children's hospitals. And it's really cool. I They're on the West Coast, but I went to the children's hospital here in St. Louis. And sure enough, I, I saw their name there. I was like, look, um, so it's totally doable. Um, they've been able to do this all over the country. And, and I believe that'll happen for you too. So, but I do wonder if people want to follow along with your story and just see how you all are kind of progressing with your goals. What is the best way people can reach out to you? How do they find you? Oh, they can go to our website. And it's really easy, onlymakebelieve.org. Onlymakebelieve.org. Yeah, they can find out about us. We have our contact information. If you know they want to get involved in their area, and it's not just okay. New York and D.C., you know, we, we have um, volunteer opportunities for anyone in those 16 cities, actually anyone in the nation. Okay. So um, I, they can find out about more about us at onlymakebelieve.org. Onlymakebelieve.org. I have to give you your props, Tasha. Oh, I'm going to be honest with you. Now that I've been in the nonprofit space for um, more than 10 years, you know, there's this is a resource mm -hmm. that really is needed and that you can make the commitment to serve the nonprofit industry mm -hmm. this way. It's, it's really remarkable because um, I would hope that whether it's an executive director or just any nonprofit professional, if mm -hmm. they could take something from these podcasts yeah. to, to, to re-energize them, help them work mm -hmm. so hard, not harder, to, yes. to inspire them, to, to mm -hmm. fight that good fight, whatever it is, for whatever right. mission they're so passionate about. So thank you yeah. for your commitment to the nonprofit space and, and, and creating this, 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 this synergy. Thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that. I I never publicly um, said those specific words, but that was really my vision for this podcast and for all people listening that, you know, I meet these really cool people that have found really creative ways of solving these really hard problems. And I meet so many nonprofits that are just trying to like recreate the wheel time and time again. And they want to learn better ways, but they just don't simply have the time to do it. So I thought, you know, why don't I just start recording these conversations and <laughs> making them accessible for people and then not only putting them on a podcast, but putting them on a search engine like YouTube, which by the way, anyone listen, go to YouTube and subscribe because then people can search for, you know, national programming virtually or, you know, any other issue that they might be trying to find a solution for. And the more that we build resources like this, I hope that it makes our lives a little bit easier. I always say this, uh, you know, the work is hard enough. Why make it even harder? So hopefully, you know, sharing these stories helps. If not finding the solution, stories like yours that helps inspire people. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This has been, this has been very enjoyable. Time has flown by. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, you heard it straight from Tamala. Go check out the content. If this is your first podcast, um, check out other podcasts. I think we're up to 80 something episodes, but we also have content over on our YouTube channel and wherever you find us, all I say um, is just to engage in it in some way. For those of you that don't know, just engaging it, liking, subscribing, whatever makes this content more searchable and therefore easier to find for other nonprofit leaders like yourself to get access to these resources. So Tamala, thank you again for joining us and for thank everyone listening. We will see you next time. 
That's all we have for you today. Once again, I'm Tasha Anderson with the Charity CFO, and this is a Modern Nonprofit Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to a Modern Nonprofit Podcast on all major streaming platforms so you will stay notified for when the latest episode drops, which will help you stay in the know about anything nonprofit related. Also, join our community on Facebook by searching for a Modern Nonprofit Podcast and follow us on all of our social media accounts. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.